Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Beaver Ambassador Club Hangouts on Air Fundamentals presentation. So to begin with, let me go ahead and get us into that PowerPoint presentation. And we can start from there. To start with, when we talk about Hangouts on Air, we need to address our goal. And the goal is to provide a basic understanding of Hangouts on Air capabilities. Why are we doing this? Because Hangouts on Air can be used to virtually attend the Beaver Ambassador Club business meetings at the international rallies. So that if you're unable to be present in, on site in person, you can virtually attend those meetings. Hangouts on Air has the capability of recording a presentation for eight-hour sessions, which kind of fits our needs. Hangouts on Air might also be used for seminar presentations, and that will provide a permanent archived record, video record of the seminar that can be viewed through YouTube. And if we're so inclined, if we have an announcement or something to go out to the general membership, then that can also be produced through Hangouts on Air. Uh, in terms of basic capabilities, Hangouts on Air allows for 10 concurrent users to be up online, which means that we would have one or two set up uh, in the conference room at, at the particular rally site, and that would leave us um, seven or eight positions that could be accessed remotely. So it, it provides us a lot of flexibility. Now, what is Hangouts on Air? What, what's it made up of? Well, in essence, Hangouts on Air is generated by using Google Mail, Google Plus, and YouTube. So what we're doing, Google Plus happens to be the control program uh, that we use to generate the YouTube file for our Hangout on Air. Now, how do we view this? Well, we typically use compatible browsers, and those are Mozilla's Firefox, Safari, Internet Explorer, or Google Chrome. Since all of the applications that we're talking about here are Google applications, then um, the logical best choice for browser is Google Chrome. Um, it doesn't mean that the other browsers won't work, but if there are any inconsistency, the best fallback is, like, is logically Google Chrome. Now, the presentation makes some assumptions. The first assumption is that you've completed the registration process for Google Mail, Google Plus, and YouTube channel. The second assumption is that your Google Mail, Google Plus, and YouTube accounts are currently active. And hopefully by this time or soon, you will have participated in an initial one-on-one -on -one Hangouts on Air orientation. This is intended for the officers so that um, they can get a feel for how this works by actually communicating remotely using Hangouts on Air. In terms of what do you need to know to get started, what's prerequisite knowledge? Well, it's a good idea to know where the Hangouts on Air invitations are sent. Uh, and those are through the Gmail social tab and through Go Google Plus notification process. Now, towards the end of this presentation, we'll talk about Google Plus notifications, and you'll see them a little bit. And I'm going to step out of this presentation for just a minute, and we'll take a look at the Gmail uh, social tab. So what I need to do is get us to that particular social tab. And I believe I can do that by going here. So let me share this with you. And once it comes up, I should be able to select um, 
the appropriate tab, which would be Google Mail. And what we should be looking at at this point is the inbox to Google Mail. Now you have a primary inbox and a social inbox. And that social inbox is where all of those invitations will be sent. So in this example, uh, I did a created a video earlier on, and this is the presentation that, that was set up. So that's what, what I'm talking about. In the Geek Google Mail inbox, there are three tabs, primary, social, and promotions. And this happens to get stored in that social tab. All right. So let's get back into our presentation again, which slows things down a little bit. Um, we, so we've talked about where the invitations are sent. They're either sent via Gmail to the social tab, or you get a notification through Google+. Well, um, how we identify the people that we're going to send that information to is through the circles associated with Google+. Circles enable users to organize people into groups or lists for sharing across various Google products and services. Once a circle is created, a Google Plus user can share specific private content to only that circle. Therefore, I created for each of you a Beaver Ambassador Club circle, and BAC-themed con content can be shared with uh, your colleagues in that particular circle. You also have the ability to share uh, content with the public, which is a much larger circle, um, or with everyone if you so choose. Hmm. Now, if, if we carry this concept of circles a little further, what I did is I went into a Google Plus page, and in the drop-down menu, I selected people. And then once, once that screen display came up, I selected your circles. And this is the result. Associated with the user, Region 5 VP, we have several circles associated with them. The first four are default circles for Google. The next two are circles that were created. BAC was created to, to contain all of the officer identities by the officer names. And, and the reason they were done by titles rather than by individual names is that so when you move on from the position that you're holding, your successor can pick up that same account and, of course, change their picture but essentially go forward without reinventing the wheel or rebuilding all of this. Now, if we were to select that BAC circle, what we would find is all of the officers are listed in that particular circle. So if I want to send a, a notification or an email or a message to all of those individuals, I simply have to select that circle, and it'll automatically go out to all of those individuals. In addition to that, we establish YouTube channels. Well, what's a YouTube channel? Let me clear this mess up, erase all of the ink on the slide. Uh, a YouTube channel is where we track uh, all of those um, beaver videos that we've created. So it's under each individual's YouTube channel. And what you'll notice here is that I'm under the Art Region 5 Vice President's channel, and we've created a custom entry under there at a URL, and it's uh, HTTP secure uh, www.youtube.com slash user slash BAC5VP. So if the Region 5 Vice President wants to direct general membership or members within the region to a video associated uh, with that particular position, 
He can do so by simply using that URL, he or she. Okay, so that's that's one of the uh, byproducts of creating Hangouts on Air structures is that we've also created uh, unique user identities for Google Plus, for Gmail, and for YouTube. And we've created YouTube a YouTube channel, which means that we can store much longer videos uh, under that specific channel. Okay, let's get into the actual presentation. And your goals with, or the objectives with Hangouts on Air is the first thing we need to be able to do is determine what the bandwidth is, where we happen to be, or at a campground that we're going to, or more importantly, a campground perhaps where we're going to hold an international rally. We're going to have to determine the usage and bandwidth requirements in that campground one way or another. From an individual perspective, if you're invited to attend a Hangouts on Air session, we've got to be concerned with some of the mechanical constraints. That is, what kind of lighting have you got? Uh, what sort of camera are you using? And what's most importantly, what are your audio elements and what are the potential issues? How can we avoid those issues? Then once we've made that determination and you've entered a Hangouts on Air session um, and pre-tested your elements, you've got a few apps that are used for participants that are invited to a session as, as well as for the host or moderator. So we'll talk about that. Finally, we want to walk through how you go about setting up a Hangouts on Air session if it, at some point you decide to host one, that might be useful information. And for most of you, if you choose not to host a Hangouts on Air session but would like to attend one as a participant, then there's a second uh, setup structure that we'll go through for the associated guests. Okay, let's get into the bandwidth requirements. The minimum bandwidth for a video connection is 300 kilobits per second. Outbound from you and inbound to you. Both speeds minimum are 300 kilobits per second. Optimum speed is approximately 2.6 megabits per second. It's a pretty good chunk of memory or a pretty good bandwidth requirement, excuse me. Now, that value can go up significantly depending on, one, on how many participants you have, and two, on screen resolution. With five participants, it kicks up to around 3.2. With 10, it kicks up to 4 megabits per second. The bandwidth settings that we're talking about are, in fact, adjustable, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But I want to give you some information on what I found looking at YouTube and how much bandwidth was used for different sites. I looked at Geeks on Tour because they're out there and they're typically doing uh, remote presentations. And what I, the, the sampling I took looked like they were using about 740 kilobits or 333 megabits of actual usage per hour. And um, I wanted to know if that was consistent, so I looked at other sites and I did some test connections. In my test connections, I'm using a cable modem interface, so I've got much higher speeds available to me. And I was able to perform at about 3 megabits per second, or 1.35 gigabits of data usage per hour. Um, I did a second test at a lower speed because Hangouts on Air allows me, provides me the ability to choke down that throughput speed. So I went down to what's called low speed, which is 500 kilobits per second. And it worked out to about 225 megabytes per hour. And the screen display seemed acceptable. It's, it's degraded a little bit, but it is visually acceptable. Now, in terms of 
what can we adjust or how adjustable is it? Well, in a Hangouts on Air session, the default is Auto HD. And that's going to use whatever bandwidth is available to you for your upload and download speeds. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Then the only other three settings that you have are low speed, which is 640 by 320 or 640 by 480 display. And it uses about 500 kilobits both up and down. Very low speed uses 150 kilobits up and 500 kilobits down. Um, if you have an audio, if you want an audio only con connection, in other words, you're in a place where you don't have good bandwidth, you want to attend a meeting, and you can look at the video presentations later, then audio only is 35 kilobits up and down. Um, you can access and change your settings at any time by clicking on the bandwidth icon at the top of the uh, Hangouts on Air presentation screen. The settings you choose will stay that way until you change them to another value. So in other words, if you finish this presentation, go on and attend another one, it'll be at whatever settings you, you left it at um, until you change them again. So what I tend to do is put it back on Auto HD when I'm finished, which leaves me in a pretty good position. Okay, in terms of data usage as opposed to bandwidth and video resolution, well, the video resolution is measured in pixels per inch, and the resolution is a display resolution. So if your screen is 640 by 360, um, then 360 pixels of display is fine on, on most computer screens, and the average bandwidth requirement for that is about 750 kilobits. That's what the geeks seem to be using. It's data usage of about 338 megabits an hour. So you can choke it down to that if you want a full display of 1080 pixels, then you're going to use upwards of 4,500 kilobits or more. You can use up to around 6,000 kilobits per second which means you'd be utilizing at 4,500, you'd be utilizing about two gigabytes of data per hour. You're going to have to have a pretty good contract in order to run at that kind of rate. Uh, one other point that I want to make here before I move on is that you don't have to watch these video presentations on a computer screen. Most smart TVs have the ability to connect to a YouTube account and look at information there. The reference for the streaming speeds is the YouTube live streaming guide, and it's on the live encoder settings, bit rates, and resolutions page. Okay. When you go to a campground or you're stopped somewhere, how do you check your bandwidth? Well, the easiest way is once you've got an internet connection, you can use speedtest.net. If you're pulled over to the side of the road, there is a speedtest.net app for both um, iPhones and other smartphones, anything that's running the Google operating system. Uh, and I believe that speedtest is also available for the Windows operating system. Now, if, we're, if we were to look at this speedtest, um, what I'll need to do is step us out of this presentation for just a minute, and I'll take us right back into a screen share mode. But this time I want to look at um, what I want to look at is speed test. So under speed test, uh, I go up on www.speedtest.net, and when I begin the test, it'll first do a ping test to determine how long it takes to talk to the nearest server. Then once the ping test is completed, we'll determine the download speed that we're currently running at. And as I said before, I'm currently running on 
a cable modem, so I have relatively reasonable speed. I've got about six megabits up and a little bit over two megabits down is typically my upload speed. And that's what they're saying, about 2.16 megabits. So you can do this test at any time uh, using speedtest.net. If you're not at a campground and want to know what the campground speed is, call the office and ask them. They may not know the speed, but there's also nothing wrong with asking them to run a speed test and give you the results. Okay, and also in some campgrounds, uh, the campsites are on a different Wi-Fi network than the conference rooms or the office are. So what you want to know are the speeds associated with a conference room, or you may want to know the speeds associated with the conference room. Okay, let's let's go back into our presentation again. So let me stop sharing for just a minute, and I'll take us right straight back into that presentation, which I've got to step through a little bit of machinations to get there. So let me share it. And basically, come on. Okay, having a little technical difficulty here, but I'll get us there in just a minute. Well, I say I'll get us there in just a minute. I hope to. Hmm. Doesn't seem to want to let me have it. So let me stop sharing for just a moment. And what we're going to talk about next are two other applications that we can use for that purpose. So let me just pull those applications up. The first of those applications will be, um, come on, share it with me, will be a root metrics application. And this also, Root Metrics also has an iPhone and other smartphone app. But basically, this is another way of identifying what kind of data speeds are available. The difference here is that what we're looking at is we're looking at cellular data speeds. So I pulled up Kerrville for an example. Uh, you'll notice the address location in the upper right hand corner up here. And what it's telling me is that the bulk of the connectivity is LTE, which should mean fairly reasonable data speeds. Now I pulled up the AT&T network, which just happens to be uh, a better data network in the Kerrville area than Verizon. But you can change it from AT&T to Verizon very easily and you can see what sort of connectivity is available there. Now what's happening is that individuals are running tests using their smartphones on uh, to initiate those specific tests and they're using an app called Coverage Map to do this and that's what's generating this information. Um, that in turn is posted in a database and it provides useful information. But we, if I were to go all the way down on this, since we've got a specific address, uh, I don't see much uh, in test results in that specific area. It, as a matter of fact, it tells us there aren't enough. So what I might have to do is look at a different application. And what I'm going to look at in that second application is not so much what kind of data speeds were run on tests. What I want to know is what sort of antennas, cellular antennas, there are within the proximity. So you'll notice using the Open Signal site, I have posted 
the same address, and I can then select the towers that are available within that area. And it'll identify those specific towers where they're physically located and who owns those individual towers. Now, I don't really care who owns them because if there are towers in the area and the best provider in, if the towers in the area are Sprint towers and the best provider in the area is AT&T, what that tells me is that AT&T is leasing space on those specific towers. I just want to know proximity of the tower to where I happen to be at this point in time. And that's really what it's giving me. Okay, so let me stop the sharing again for a moment. And once sharing is stopped, and I can get back up so that I can see the screen again, the, hang the Google Hangout screen, and I can try and get us back into the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so let me do that. Let's see if I can't get us up on that specific PowerPoint presentation. Come on. It takes a little time sometimes to do some of these things. Unfortunately, the technology isn't quite immediate, but it's not bad. So we already talked about data speeds on root metrics, and we talked about open signal. So those are the ways that we pick up cellular, identify what the cellular bandwidth is in a specific area, or the ways that I use anyway. Okay, so that's pretty much how we go about getting at our bandwidth. We use a speed test, either on a smartphone, or on a computer, on a laptop, on a tablet. The same thing holds true for uh, both um, open signal and the coverage map. And by the way, they're all available as apps for the smartphones. So the next thing we want to look at are the specific elements and how we tie things together and what are some of the issues associated with the lights, the camera, and the audio. Well, to begin with, uh, we should talk about where do we watch or participate in a presentation. Uh, each point that we watch from has some pluses and minuses associated with it. If, for example, we watch from a Google Plus page and uh, our audience is watching a live presentation, let's say the general membership, then if they're watching through the Google Plus page, we can provide them advance notice of the presentation, and we can also provide a vehicle for them to ask questions that we can respond to in a live fashion. Google Plus is really the only way to do that. Uh, you can view a Hangouts on Air presentation from a YouTube page, but you can't really publish from that YouTube page until about until you actually go online, which is or until you bring it up, which is typically 30 minutes prior to the Hangout session. Usually not enough time. There's a YouTube Live page where we can also use our published address and we can provide advance notice for comments. That's the page that'll that we link to or that our audience can link to by using the use, uh, username. And finally, we can embed a player on your own individual website, again, if you're so inclined. Okay? So my first choice is Google+. Plus. I'd like both the participants, now the participants aren't watching, they're going to be sent a slightly different invite and that invite will allow them to join the presentation. Okay, what are the different roles? Well, um, the host is also typically the moderator and may also be a panelist. 
That individual originates the handouts on air session so that other panelists can utilize full screen share capabilities, which means that if, if in the meeting you need to present a spreadsheet, a Word document, or virtually anything else, you can utilize an app called Screen Share to do that, which is, by the way, what I've been using all along to provide the displays that you're watching. The maximum number of panelists in a free Hangouts on Air structure is 10 concurrent panelists. Uh, typically, we, if we're going to allow the audience at large to, to ask questions, then we'll have a social media monitor, which is a panelist that will present the audience questions. Um, the audience or the viewers, there's no limit on those numbers. You can have as many. It's, it's an all-you-can-eat situation. We could literally have an entire club watching a single video presentation from a live perspective. The panelists do have some product uh, production concerns, and the first and most important of those concerns is audio. And the reason for that is one common failing, and it's a failing not a, only in a video conferencing environment, but also in audio conferencing environments is feedback. Feedback occurs when someone is connected through a computer or a smartphone or a tablet or even a laptop, and it's usually generated because of feedback between a built-in microphone and built-in speakers. So the microphone picks up the sound from the speakers, reflects it, it may be as simple as a small echo that you hear or as severe as a screeching sound. Uh, to combat that, the easiest solution is to use a standalone headset for your speakers or a combined headset and microphone. Okay, And those are available uh, at a very reasonable price. Uh, uh, an exceptionally good microphone and headsets available for $30 from GE. And if you're interested, let me know and I'll get you the information on it. I use, I happen to use a blue Yeti microphone, which is a big omnidirectional microphone. It's USB enabled. It allows me uh, to sit back and not worry too much about the microphone noise. And you noticed I had on a headset that headset is tied in to the speakers through the microphone, so there is no feedback. A second trigger for audio feedback is two people sitting in the same room connected to the same video conference. So now I hear the sound from one and the sound from another. You want to minimize the background noise, and when you're not actually presenting, are not the active presenter, it's a good idea to mute your microphone. You can do that at the top center of your screen. You'll find a black uh, microphone symbol with a slash through it. When you select it, it'll turn red, and that indicates that you're muted. When you come off a of mute, you just hit that red icon, and it'll turn black again. Okay? Good audio is our single most important component in a video conference. Any, of it, any video conference, whether it's um, a Google Hangout on Air or anything else you choose to use. In terms of lighting, the intent of lighting is to get even distribution of light, avoiding deep shadows on the subjects. Uh, in an ideal environment, you use three-point lighting. That is a key light, a fill light, and a backlight. Key light typically sits uh, facing you frequently from behind the camera or actually off to one side at a 45 degree angle. That gives you highlights on the face. That's complemented with a fill light, which is a slightly dimmer light that's 45 degrees on the opposite side of the camera, again facing you. And the third light is uh, is called 
a backlight. And that's a light source from behind you, typically above and behind or off to one side and behind. What I use to compensate for that, I use uh, a couple of overhead lights or lights above. I have a light above my desk and a light behind me uh, fixed on a, on a um, off at about 45 degrees. And it happens to be on a fan in the room. So uh, you, if you understand what the purpose of three-point lighting is, you can adjust to that situation and address it. In a coach, it's not too difficult to get overhead lighting going. Uh, backlighting, you might sit with your back to the front window with the screens drawn, just as a suggestion. Um, the other issue that we have to deal with is glare. Try to avoid bright light sources spilling into the camera. As far as a camera is concerned, uh, a very good camera, external camera, is a Logitech C920. They're about $70. If you don't want to spend the money, that's okay, because you have more than acceptable cameras in most PCs. Uh, most Windows devices and Apple devices, so it's in tablets, it's in computers, it's in laptops. We all have uh, cameras that are, are quite acceptable. Okay, that's pretty much it for lighting and the camera and audio, audio being the most important. And the key is to isolate the speakers from the microphone so that you don't get an echo. One of the pre-setup things that we do is we check to make sure that your sound is, is usable. Um, not much else I can say about that. We want to take a look at the Hangout on Air apps next. So let's move into that. And the first app that I want to talk about is Screen Share. You'll notice in the upper left corner that you see an, uh, a green icon next to apps. Uh, apps appear will appear in your screen on the left hand side. Now most of the time you don't see anything over there. The only time you see anything over there is when you move a mouse close to it and then all of your apps will appear in a vertical strip. The most important app for uh, us as individual users or as participants in a session is the screen share app because when it's our turn to present if we have any content we have to get out there that content is pulled through screen share so you simply select the item that you want to share like for example here um, if I wanted to show a video on brighter headlights for your beaver uh, I might click on that and then select share and that would allow me to share that video with the group at large. Okay. Um, there are two that are, appear on every single screen share identifier. One called screen and one called Google Plus Hangouts. Okay, the screen shows me whatever's available on the screen at the time. Like right now, um, I have this window, this share window up, so that's why you see it. If I actually click on that, though, uh, there's a rule about this. This is a mirroring application. So you always click on it when you have another participant selected. Now, the per Participants are, come on, here. The bottom of the screen, this area of the screen, is used for a film strip. And if we have 10 participants, you'd see active pictures for all 10 of them at the bottom of the screen. If you select another participant other than yourself, then you can use Screen or Google Plus Hangouts. If you choose not to select another participant 
and to try and do um, screen share, I'll show you what's going to happen. I'm going to actually kick us out of out of sharing again and go back into come on take me out of here I know that you can see me I just couldn't see you so I'll go back into screen share again and this time I'm going to select Google Plus Hangouts which should pull up the screen and when I share it watch what happens what you see is you see images going off to infinity it's because it's a mirroring operation the only way that this actually works is for me to go in and select a different user instead of selecting myself and screen share from there. As long as I'm the one that's selected in the center of the screen, I can't use this particular segment of the application. Okay, so let me stop this. I want to go back into screen share again. And this time, I'm going to go back into the presentation that we've been looking at, the PowerPoint slideshow. Let me share that. And now, I'll take us to the next application. This application is called Toolbox. And what we use extensively in Toolbox is called Lower Third. We access it by hitting uh, the first icon on the left in the toolbox. And by the way, when I select a toolbox, when I click on this icon on the left, what it does is opens a window on the right side. That window is called the lower third. The lower third is where I can get a banner across the, across the lower third of my screen. I can put my name in there. I can put my title in there. I can add a tagline. So if I were to take us out and show you the lower third that I've set up for R5VP, it would, in the title location, where I've got Keith Cooper on this case, it would say uh, BAC R5VP. And the tagline would have my email address in it. Okay? Now, in order to see this display so that it's readable, so that I can see it, I have to change it and reverse it because it's I'm standing behind the screen so I see the back side of it. That's the second app that everybody uses. You're able to use Toolbox, you're able to use Screen Share. The third app that you might want to use is YouTube. If you have a YouTube presentation you want to make or want to show, or you're using this for a seminar process, not simply for meetings, then what you might do is select the YouTube app and you can preload uh, your videos on, onto your playlist and then select them. Like for example, in this case, I preloaded Roy Mueller's brighter headlights for your, for your Beaver presentation uh, that's out on YouTube so I can step through those if I'm so inclined. Any user can use these particular apps. Uh, by the way, I, I tried to list them in the priority that you were like that was likely to be most useful, with screen share being the most important, toolbox probably the next most important, and on some occasions you might use YouTube. The cameraman app is a different um, type of app in that Cameraman is an app that's used by the host or moderator. It's really not, and it's the most important app for the host or moderator because it gives them some control of what we see in the center screen. In a normal environment where I have multiple attendees in the film strip below, what you see in the main screen is determined by who's talking in the film st strip. So if they get an argument in the film strip, this thing's going to flip back and forth. Not a great situation. I want to be able to control it. So what I have the ability to do uh, is by selecting this second button, if I happen to be the host or moderator, 
what I've done is I've told you that what's going to be seen by the audience at large, not necessarily by other participants, is the screen that I select to be in the center. Um, I also would likely select the third item. And the reason I select the third item on here, come on, is that by selecting that third item, new guests in a large group broadcast, come online muted, pre-muted, in order to unmute. And, and they'll know that they're muted because in the top of the screen, on their screen, this icon up here, come on, having a little trouble drawing today, will always be red. And since it's red, that says I'm muted. If I'm also muted here, I'm not going to see anything because that's, that's my camera. And by the way, when we talked about bandwidth setups, that's done here to the right here. So those are the, the items that we look at on there. Cameraman is an app that's used by the host only, or, and it's only visible to the host. All right, the next app would be the control room app. And as participants come online, this is where the um, moderator, as each participant comes online, you'll see their picture appear over here. And there may be up to 10 of them in here. We can mute them. We can turn off their video capabilities. Uh, and we can adjust their sound levels. So if they come in and their sound level is too high or too low, we have the ability to adjust it by utilizing the control room app. Now again, this is only intended for the moderator or host of the particular presentation that we're talking about. The host also has the ability before they start the broadcast to initiate a Q&A session. Okay, and they must initiate it before they actually start the broadcast. It won't work after that. And it's this Q&A icon that I've enlarged in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. It's in the banner, about four down in this particular case. This is what allows our audience at large the ability <coughs> to ask questions that we can then respond to in a live environment. You'll notice I'm erasing um, all of the graphics I'm putting on here as I do this. This is to keep the presentation moving forward to prevent it from bogging down. I apologize, but kind of need to do that. Chat. Chat is an option that's available, but it's really only available to the participants. So they can send messages between one another or to the group at large if they have the chat app open. Now, how do I invite panelists? When you go to, through a setup process, there's an invite window. That's to invite viewers. To invite panelists, I have to select this area up here on the screen. And once I've selected it, it will allow me to invite any circle that I have associated with me or any user uh, may be invited in that way. If you're not invited in this fashion, you, you can view a presentation and a live presentation at that, but you cannot participate. You must be invited in order to participate. That pretty much wraps up. Let me go back and clean that up before we leave here. Uh, that pretty much wraps up the apps associated with this. 
So let's walk through the two setup methods. The first, we're going to go through the setup that the host goes through, and you may or may not use this, but I want you to have a point of reference that you can come back to and look at to do a setup. It's fairly simple. There's seven or eight steps associated with it. Uh, each of them is displayed in a video, and, and we'll show it to you. And then we'll walk through the guest setups, or actually, how do you accept an invite? Okay. The first thing that we need to talk about, though, is pre-production. What do you need to do in terms of pre-production? You need to make sure that you've got adequate bandwidth available. And make sure that each participant is in a quiet room without significant background. Lighting is also important. So we've got to scout those locations. If we're talking about a seminar type presentation, it's a good idea to do a hangout dry run with the participants before you actually do um, the presentation. By doing that, what that does is makes our presentations go much, much smoother. Uh, and the key to all of this is an etiquette issue, and that's make sure you mute your microphone unless you're actually presenting at that point in time. Once we keep that in mind, let's go through the steps to set up a Hangout. The first thing that we do is select Hangouts from the drop-down menu on the left of the Google Plus page. Now, how do I get to the Google Plus page? Simple. I can go to Google, collect my plus name here, and that'll take me to Google Plus. I can pull down this block of nine entries, select Google Plus in there. It's a half a dozen ways to get to Google Plus. But once I'm there and I'm logged in, I know I'm logged in because I see my particular picture in that small circle in the upper right hand corner. I can select Hangouts. Now, once I select Hangouts, what's going to appear in the top center is Hangouts on Air. So I simply select Hangouts on Air, and you'll notice right here, the next thing I can do is start a Hangout on Air session. This is also where I go to view currently live running Hangout on Air sessions that are out available to the public. This, again, is for viewing, not necessarily for presenting or participating. Okay. When I go to set up a Hangout on Air session, I've got to identify what it's for. In this case, I said, oh, this is my first Hangout. Okay. And I want to test my systems. So by way of that, I'm providing a title and an explanation. I can provide a start time, so if I say later, that allows me to schedule an event with a date and a time and the duration. My guess, best guess at a du um, duration. I can set my audience as the public or an individual. And if I select an individual, I can delete the public out of here. And once I've done that, then I can share this. And as soon as I share it, what happens is that I'll go to a, an events page, sub page on my Google Plus page. And it will identify, it'll provide the title of my particular Hangout. In this case, it was first Hangout Example. I can edit that title if I want. Uh, I can also share the event with others. Okay, but The event itself is right below it. This is the event that we're going to call. So when I'm ready to start that event, I simply press the Start button. Okay, and let me, come on. What will happen as soon as I start it is I'll, I'll actually call Hangouts on Air to start the process. But I wanted to mention something else here, and that's Q&A. Remember that I said Q&A was an app, an app that needed to be started before 
we actually went live on the Hangouts on Air session. This is one place where you can start q and I can select that button here. When I come up in the session, it'll be turned on if I do that. If I just press the Start button, the first screen that I'll see is a Hangout on Air load screen. Okay, but what you notice at the top of that Hangout on Air load screen is an address in here. That address up there happens to be the address, that HTTP address, happens to be the address of this particular session. So you can copy and paste that uh, if, if you want to provide this to non-Google Plus attendees. That'll give them a link that they can attach to to look at this presentation. They can't participate, but they can view. Okay. Now this, this screen is called automatically. The next screen comes up and it's another invite. You want to invite guests. Again, this is an invite to view. And you can make it age appropriate if you're so inclined, or you can simply skip it. If you skip it, that's fine. What you'll see next is your your face, whether pretty or not, in the middle of a screen, and your screen will contain all of your um, Hangouts on Air apps, your screen status, and you're ready to start the broadcast. Now, if you need to, what you need to do at this point is select additional participants. So we do that by clicking on this button and selecting those particular participants. This is, this is what adds panelists or participants to the Hangouts on Air session and what generates boxes in the film strip across the bottom of the screen. Okay. That's pretty much it for you go through those steps and you're ready to start a broadcast. All that's necessary now is to hit the Start Broadcast button. So it's a fairly straightforward and simple process. If Once you've been invited to a session, it's also a simple process to accept that invite. And like everything else, you can do it a number of different ways. So I'll talk about several of them. First of all, uh, if your Google Plus page is open and you expect an invite because uh, you received a viewing invite that said, hey, in three days at, at 9.30 in the morning, we're going to hold this thing, that's kind of like saying, hey, 9.30 in the morning, maybe I should have my Google Plus page open. If it's open, you'll hear a bell, much like uh, an old telephone bell. And on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see a green pop-up come up from the bottom. And in order to join this particular Hangout on Air session, all you need to do is select Answer. Okay? That will get you into the Hangout on Air session. Now, that bell only lasts for about 20 seconds. So if you didn't come into Google Plus right away, and maybe you came in a couple of minutes later, well, you still might see, and I, I want to emphasize the, the word might, you might see a little different um, display, and it would look something like this. There'll be no audio, okay? There'll be no answer button, but simply click on the video call bar, which is the green bar, and again, you'll enter the Hangout on Air. Now, if you come in and you don't see either one of those, then what you want to do is click on this new button. It may be one, it may be two, it may be three, can't say. But it'll be a blue button, blue new button, in the upper left side of the Google Plus page. Don't respond to the question down here that says, are you going to watch? 
because there's a difference between viewing and a significant difference between viewing and participating. You don't want to view it, you want to participate in it. To do that, when you select that new button, what will come up now is the title of the Hangout and a button that says Join Hangout. Select the Join Hangout button, which is right here. And once you select that Join Hangout button, then you'll enter the Hangout on Air session. So when we join the Hangout, what happens is we get uh, the screen again, and all three of the approaches we talked about will get us there, and there's a half a dozen more that can get us to the same point. I just tried to select some simple ones. Um, you'll see the load screen. The load screen, in turn, will be followed by a legal disclaimer screen. You have to read and acknowledge, read and accept. Basically, you got to click on the OK, got it button after you check I have read and acknowledged the legal statement before you can proceed. Once you've done so, you'll see something like this. Hopefully a prettier picture or prettier face behind there, but you'll get your particular picture that you have set up for your user and your face behind it. Click on join and you will then join the Hangout on Air session. That now makes you a member of that Hangout on Air session. And the reason you see Keith and my picture is my picture is actually coming in as R5, Region 5 VP, and I've got a second user up on a laptop is Keith. That user is in control right now, so that's what you see in the screen. You'll also notice that I'm off air at this point. Okay, I'm off air because I haven't gone live yet. Um, that's up to the host to take the session live. Think of this as a green room until we go live. It gives us a way to check the incoming participants audio, video, lighting before a session and to work out any other issues that are necessary at the time. That pretty much concludes what's required to join a Hangout. Uh, if you have not set up Google+, set up YouTube, set up Google Mail, there's some excellent stuff out there. Google Plus account set up, I've identified. Uh, I've identified setups for the accounts and the tutorial for both a Hangout guest and really um, some of the best I found was Ronnie Bincer. He's called the Hangout Helper and he's got two sites, a Hangout Helper and a Hangout Mastery site and there's some pretty good presentations at both of those. So I've listed some sites you can go to and look at presentations about Hangouts on Air if you want more information. And that pretty much wraps it up. We've gone through what's required for bandwidth, usage requirements for Hangouts on Air. We've talked about uh, the elements and issues. We've identified the apps, and we walked through the basic setup. So I hope this meets your needs. If not, send me an email. Have a great day. I'm going to go ahead and, and kick us out of here now. Well, maybe I am. And then we'll let me stop sharing so I can. There we go. Stop the broadcast. So, again, have a great day.